Well, this message, I'm, I'm, uh, I always say this every Sunday, it seems like, I'm excited about this word. I really am. I mean, I got up at 4 o'clock this morning with it bubbling up in me, and uh, I believe I got some revelation that's going to fuel you into, the, into, into moving forward. I'm not going to spend any time on review today. Um, the messages are online if you want to go back and watch them. Before I start, though, I do want to address my message from, I don't even know which one it was, I think it was two weeks ago, um, from Ephesians chapter 3, and it was brought to my attention that, uh, that I may have come across in a way that was not honoring to Israel or to Jewish people, and that is not my heart in any way, shape, or form. Um, Genesis 1, I mean 12.3 says, I will bless those who bless you. He's talking to Abraham and, and this covenant. I will curse him who curses you, and in all the and all the families of the earth shall be blessed in him. So I don't want to come across as, as, as being in any way, shape, or form disrespectful or dishonoring any of that towards the nation of Israel or Jewish people. So if that's what you picked up on, that was not my intention. The reality is that we need to pray for our Jewish friends because they need to be in Christ. And I don't know how it's going to end up at the end. I, I do know this, that, that, that God created Israel with a purpose and a plan, and he will have his purpose and plan fulfilled. Um, but the Gentile church may be a part of that purpose and plan for them. Who knows? So be praying for them, love them, reach them just as you would any other unbeliever, but remembering that they've got a heritage and a foundation that you can build from. Amen? Amen. So if you picked up on that, please forgive me. That was not my intent. Today, we're moving on into, into a really fun part of this. To be honest with you, I'm looking forward to the second half of the book of Ephesians because I'm into the practical, and the practical stuff is really starting to come now. I like practical theology. I understand you have to lay the foundation, and I understand there's some great truths that, that really lead into why the practical is necessary. So, because we're in Christ, the rest of the book is... is the rest of the letter goes back to we're in Christ. So the in Christ part, is that's why it's the name of the series. Uh, we're going to spend like 12 sessions on in Christ. Being in Christ is of the utmost importance. What I want to know, and you can help me with this, we're going to be a little bit informal at the least the beginning of this message. Why don't God's people step out in faith? You're God's people, and... Some of you step out in faith. Some of us step out in faith once in a while. Some of us have never stepped out in faith. That may be doing something as, as little as paying for somebody's gas at the gas station. It may be something as big as planning a seven-day revival at the fairgrounds and saying, I don't know how to do this, but I'm going to try. Why is it that many of us never step out in faith? Fear of man. Fear of man. Any other thoughts? Fear of failure. Fear of failure. Pride. Pride. Now, what's pride related to? What's the flip side of pride? Anybody know? Fear. Somebody said it. Pride is fear, by the way. If you're prideful, it's because you're afraid of being exposed. Gossip. I like that. That's fear too, though, right? Because you're afraid. You might be afraid that somebody's going to talk about you. Fear, fear, fear. Is it really God speaking to me? I like that. Rebellion, it is, rebellion. So rebellion, fear, and he, actually I read this somewhere a few years ago. I don't know who said it, uh, so I can't give them the credit, so I'll take credit for it, okay? They said the number one reason that people don't ever step out in faith is because they don't feel worthy because they're in sin. So they feel condemned. God can't use me. Yesterday I did this, or I thought that, or I'm doing all this stuff. God... So the accuser of the brethren keeps reminding of you of your sin, so you never step out in faith because you don't feel like you're worthy. Does that make sense? Fear. See, I knew. I read your minds. No, I didn't. Fear, fear is the number one reason people don't step out in faith. And then the other reason, I believe, rebellion, of course, but uh, that's just where somebody needs a big spanking. But this other one, I believe condemnation, 
I believe that God wants to today break off some fear and break off some condemnation. He, wants, he doesn't want any of his, his children feeling like they're under condemnation, having the finger pointing at them all the time. Because, you know, a couple of years ago when uh, Kim Pensinger was here, he said something. I gotta, isn't it awesome, you know, somebody can say something in passing, you just get a revelation, it changes your view of, of God and of yourself. He said, God's not standing over there in the corner waiting for you to mess up so he, he can spank you. Isn't that good? He's not. He loves you. He's not waiting to spank you. He's, he's encouraging you. He's, he's got his arms wide open waiting for you to run back to him. You do get spankings because he loves you, but he's not this big, mean, ugly God that wants to throw things at you. But if you had a dad that was kind of like that, it's pretty hard to take that off from that father figure, isn't it? It's, now, this is another saying. I don't know who said this either, but I believe it with everything in me. And if you go through church history and if you look at, at people that have done great things, it's not those that love God that do the greatest things. How many of you love God? How many of you love God? Come on. Don't be afraid. Raise your hand. It's not a trick question. I hope all of us love God. Hopefully all of us understand what he did for us so that we love him in return and we just like, wow, the creator of the universe died, sent his son to die for me. I love him. So there's millions and billions of Christians around the world who love God and most of them don't do anything. They sit in their pew and wait. Why? Because it's not those that love God. It's those that know how much God loves them that do the greatest things. It's when you know that, that He loves you so much that, you're, that you can overcome the fear, you can overcome the pride, you can overcome the rebellion. Because He loves you so much, you know that you're safe. You know that nothing's, He's not going to harm you. It's all for good. So you can step out into it. It's those that know that God loves them. And I underline the word know there because it's not reading about it in a book. You're not going to know how God loves you by reading it in a book. You're not going to know how much God loves you by me telling you. You're going to know how much God loves you by experiencing Him. Kanosko or yada. Yada, yada, yada. Those that know their God will be strong and do great exploits. This comes out of Daniel and the word know there is the word yada. Those that know their God, that have experienced their God, that know Him by experience, will be strong and do great exploits. How many of you feel like you're doing some great exploits? Come on. You probably all are doing more than you think you are. And when you leave here, you're going to be encouraged to do even more, okay? You're going to... Who laughed over there? You... Come on. No, I'm, you can laugh at me if you want. <laughs> laugh with me. The irony of it. I like it. Those that know their God will be strong. Now, last two weeks ago, we talked about what? See, you're all paying attention. I don't know if anybody else got nothing out of that message. It was, it was one of the most powerful messages I've ever heard. It, it shattered me. And, and at the end of our strength, his strength is energized. When we're done, when we're done trying to make it happen, when we're done fooling around, when we're done playing church, when we're done, and we know we're done, then he shows up and he is strong. So in our weakness... When we know Him, we know how weak we are. If, see, if you experience Him, if you come into His presence, if, you're, if you come into the throne room, throne room like Isaiah did, you realize how wonderful and awesome and powerful He is, and you also understand how pitiful, weak, and dirty you are. So you, you're weak. You know you're weak when you know you're God, but you also know that He can do anything in and through you. Most people don't do the great exploits because they don't know that God loves them. Therefore, they're under condemnation and fear. Let's, did you bring your Bibles? Show me your Bible. Come on. If you didn't bring one, next week bring it. Okay? No condemnation, though. I'm not going to come back there and pick on you. 
Um, if you don't have a Bible, we can get you one. If you don't know where your Bible is, find it. I had uh, breakfast for three hours with, with Vince last Monday. <laughs> and he, he said he was actually, absolutely amazed how many people don't read their Bible. He said, you, cannot, you don't know how to live unless you know the Word. This is the instruction booklet on how to, how to live. So if you're not getting the Word into you, you need to, because otherwise you won't know how to live. The other thing he said, just this is a little bunny trail, okay? We're talking about giving and tithing and all of that stuff. And he said years and years and years ago, he put himself in the basket. So if you can picture Vince sitting in this basket, maybe they were bigger baskets, I don't know. But he put himself in the basket and he got to take 90% back out. Because he owns it all. So Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm going to read from the New King James, starting at verse uh, 14. For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole earth in heaven and earth is named, that he would, be, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. And then he ends it with this awesome reality. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, according to all the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. Glory. Now, for this reason, the Amplified tells you for what the reason is, seeing the greatness of the plan by which you are being built up together in Christ. So for this reason, he's looking back at everything he said in the, in the, in the previous three chapters, and he's saying, for this reason, I pray for you. I bow my knee before the Father. For you. And in the New Living Translation, it, it doesn't say um, from the Father, it says from, the from He who created all things. Now, I, I was going to go down this road and, and talk about family and Father and all of that stuff, because that's very interesting and it really piqued my curiosity. Maybe another time we can spend some time on this, on, on, chat, on verse 15, because it's very interesting. Because the Father named, every family comes from the Father. Why is family important? Because it all comes from the Father. All of it. Every family gets their name from the Father. Why do you think Satan wants to destroy the family? Because he wants to do away with the character of God. That he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened, established. You're going to be strengthened, you're going to be established, you're going to build some foundations with with might, which is dunamis. Remember the word dunamis? We talked about that a couple times now. That's the word power. That's my f catalyst fantasy football team name, dunamis, power. <laughs> Means dynamite. Through his spirit in the inner man. So his spirit in you is where the power is. Amen. That Christ may dwell in your hearts. The word dwell means what? It's not a trick question. Live. So that Christ may live. Maybe that's where they got the sinner's prayer from. It's the only place that I can even think of that's close. That he may live in your hearts through faith. That you being rooted and grounded. Rooted. Rooted speaks, down, speaks into going down deep. And it takes energy to go down deep. Anybody ever seen a, a tree that's blown over by the roots? It's because they didn't go deep. Trees that go, put their roots down deep do not get blown over by the roots. And that founded, grounded, founded, that foundation, the very foundation is love. Hello. It's Avon calling. Oh, that's ding dong. No problem. You may have, that you may have the power to understand Wrap your head around. Get this. You've got to have the power to understand. How many of you have the power to understand God's love? This is Paul's prayer for us, that we'd have the power to be, able to, to be able to comprehend, to be able to wrap our head around, 
as all God's people should. So we're all in this. <laughs> I thought it was just for the super saints. I thought it was for the apostles and prophets that they could comprehend God's love. No, it's for you and for me, for every single one of us. Paul's prayer is that we could be able to wrap our heads around, we could comprehend, we could, we could grasp how wide, how long, how high, and how deep his love is. Now, I saw a lot of different things as commentators, you know, that are writing about how high means this. And you know what I think? I think it just means that his expanse of love is just too great for us to even comprehend. He goes on to say that, actually. He wants us to have knowledge of something that's unknowable. That's his prayer. We cannot fully ever comprehend his love, yet that's Paul's prayer that we can un understand his love. May you experience, experience the love of Christ, though it through the... Now when I do that, when I'm recording my little spot, I have to push stop, and I have to push stop and start all over again. Here I don't have to push stop, I can just say, well, bidi-bidi-bidi-bidi. <laughs> May you experience the love of Christ though it is too great to fully understand. So he's talking about experiential knowledge, but you can never know it. There's two different words here. Your experiential knowledge he wants you to have, but you can never fully know it any other way. The only way you can even begin to comprehend the, co comprehend the love of God is by experience. How many of you ex have experienced his love? If you haven't, Today may be your day to really experience his love. He loves you so much. We sing about it. I mean, that, that, that hurricane song, you know, if love were an ocean, I'd be sinking. Oh, how he loves us. We sing it. Do we comprehend it? How much does he love us? May you experience the love of Christ. When we know that God loves us, we no longer live in fear. Amen. When we experience his love, fear goes out the window. Now, this is a truth that we have to get because the seven days of revival. You know, God is up to something. And he's not up to something that he's done before. This is, there's a reality that's happening. And we're in a reformation. I like that word. I'm a reformer. So are you. Martin Luther started all this, you know, back in 1517 on Halloween Day. And it's not stopped. Acts 3.21 tells us that he's not coming back until all things are restored. Amen. The restoration of the church is happening. The, the revelation of we're saved by grace through faith alone started this whole ball with Martin Luther. He put his 95 thesis on the door and uh, the Catholic Church didn't like that very much. So he was called a Protestant, a protester, because he protested too much. But he protested the truth. And then more truth started to get added to it. The truth of, of David's praise and worship and the, and the whole praise and worship movement. You know, it wasn't that many years ago when you went to church, you didn't praise and worship, you listened to a choir. And then we moved into some hymns where we got to sing, but... If you're like me, most of those hymns I can't sing because somebody wrote them for professionals. A lot of them. Not all of them. There's some I really like. There's some I wish I could sing better because I'd really love to sing them with more. But here I am just trying to do my best to get through them. And by the way, probably the people in the church when those were written probably didn't like them very much. Um, I think it was How Great Thou Art was written to a drinking song. Is that true? Do you know? So they took, a, they took a tune out of the bar and changed the words and it became the church song. What a deal, huh? I bet there was some complaining going on by the sheep. Now we look back and what a wondrous hymn. How great thou art. Maybe it wasn't how great thou art, so don't quote me on that. It was one of those songs. Martin Luther was, was a reformer, so he took what the world had and he changed it and brought it into God's glory. So it was Martin Luther and, and the return of praise and worship and the Davidic, the Davidic worship time, the, the return of the, the pastor. I mean, it used to be just the priest. The return of the shepherd to the flock. And then in 1906, what happened in, in California? Anybody know? Azusa Street happened. The Holy Spirit was poured out and the gifts were restored to the church. 
And, and over the years since then, that's been changing and growing and more revelation has come. And then back in the 80s, the prophets were restored to the church. Were you a Christian back before the 80s? Somebody said they were a prophet. They were like, what? In the 90s, the apostles began to be restored. Why? Because he has a job for you to do. Because he gave us, this is next, the next two weeks message, the day of the saints is here. It's not coming, it's here. The ministry of the saints is here. You can no longer be obedient to God and sit on your butt. I'm just saying it like it is. Maybe you could do that 30 years ago, I don't know, but no longer can you be obedient to God and not do the ministry that He has called you to because you all have a ministry. That's why this message is so important because we cannot be stopped by fear or by condemnation or by rebellion from doing what God has called you to do. You don't just come to church. That's a paradigm shift. 20 years ago, if somebody said that, they would have looked like, what are you talking about? Of course we go to church. Yeah, you go to church. But church is not a building. It's not, a, it's not an event. It's a people. It's a people that do the things that God has called them to do. You know in Matthew 7 where Jesus said, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. But Lord, we cast out demons in your name and we did all these wonderful things. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. That's a scary passage, isn't it? You know what's really interesting about that passage? I always thought it went on to say, only those who believe. That's not what it says. It says, only those who do the will of my Father. And we don't earn our salvation by doing. Hear me. We don't earn our salvation by doing. But when we're saved, we do the things that God asks us to do. Because if we, if we love Him, we obey Him. When we know that God loves us, what is the height, the, the, the breadth, the, the length, the height, the length, the depth, all of those things? There's only four. I can't remember them. Whatever they are, if we could begin to comprehend them, and that's Paul's prayer, that we could begin to comprehend this unknowable thing, then fear would go. Because love cast out fear. Love cast out fear. And I remember one of the first messages, Linda, I ever heard her speak, it was about fear. And she said, the opposite of fear is faith. And it's true. When you step out in faith, you're stepping out against fear. Because when you step out in faith, it's not going to be something that comes natural. It's going to be something that goes against your reason. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not made, been, been made perfect in love. When we know how much he loves us, fear goes. Think about it. If we understand, see, if you understand that he's the creator of the universe and he has all power and he's all knowing and all these wonderful things, but you don't know that he loves you, then you're still afraid. But if you know that all of that is wrapped up in love towards you, he's going to do what's best for you and for him. He may put you through some things. We live in a fallen world. Life is not always going to be easy, but he's always going to be there with you. And you will never get to experience him unless you step out in faith. Chris and Linda got to, got to know him as their provider. Because what, the, what was the estimate of this? What was the expense of the seven days of revival? Do you mind me asking? Ten or eleven thousand dollars. And did you have that sitting around? You just wanted to invest? No. No. So here's this couple. They're just trying to, just like most of us, get by, pay the bills. You got four kids. When you guys go out to eat, that's like uh, a lot of money. <laughs> Even at McDonald's now, what's four times ten? So they stepped out in faith. Now they know him as their provider because he provided. You didn't go bankrupt, did you? Was everything provided for? He provided through his people 
through obedient people that gave as they were called to give, he provided. Isn't that cool? Now, you would never know him as your provider unless you step out in faith and you risk something financially. That's just finances. But it's true in every realm. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. If you've got fear in your life, it's not from God. If you've got anxiety in your life, and I know there's some people in this room, I don't know this in the spirit, I know this in the natural, there's people in this room that deal with anxiety. Stuff, it all rises up and it's like they can't even breathe. That's not God. God wants to set you free from that. He, if, you, if you can just begin to understand how much he loves you, that will start to go away. When we know that God loves us, we no longer live under condemnation. And that condemnation, I experience it. I'm supposed to be the pastor of a church, and you said that, and you thought that, and you did, really? And you're supposed to get up tomorrow and preach? What are you, crazy? There ain't going to be any anointing on your life tomorrow because you're a sinner. Anybody relate? Yes. You think you're going to go to work and you're going to tell people about Jesus and last night you spent three hours looking at porn? Wow, it's quiet in here. <laughs> <laughs> it's making us think, isn't it? Because we all hear that voice. We're all sinners and there's no judgment. I'm not judging your sin. I've got to judge the fruit of your sin. I'm not judging your sin because we're all sinners. He is the judge and he will, he will judge you. But the, inter the great thing is that he paid the price for it. Amen. So isn't it awesome, his mercy and his grace? We don't want to ever take it for granted. I don't believe in sloppy agape or greasy grace. We come to him. We sincerely repent. We ask for forgiveness. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to cleanse us and forgive us from all unrighteousness. Isn't that amazing? But then, so we've done all of that. We're clean before God, but Satan doesn't let up. That accuser keeps going. Yeah, so what? You said a little prayer. You think God forgave you? <laughs> See, that condemnation, that, that, that thing that most believers sit under, because most, mo all believers are sinners. So we all miss it, and we, and we hear this voice, you're not good enough, you're not good enough, you're not good enough, you're not good enough. And we believe it. So we stay stagnant, we stay stymied, we stay sitting on our, on our seat because we hear this thing in our head. There's a measure of truth to it. That's why it works. If there was no truth in it, you'd be like, Phew. that's why I don't understand why atheists hate God so much. I don't believe in the Easter Bunny. I don't get mad if somebody else does. I don't go around trying to stamp out fairies and, and goblins and stuff. I mean... I, if you, if, you, if, you hate, if you don't believe in God, why do you hate him? Why do you care if somebody prays to some magical, mystical thing if he's not there? Because there's no such thing as atheist. How'd I go down that trail? I don't know. <laughs> Maybe somebody need to hear that. I don't know. Sorry. Bunny trail. Above all things, have a fervent love one for another, for love covers a multitude of sins. And I know this is taking this out of context a little bit, but there's a truth in it, that God's love covers your sin. God's love, by the blood of Jesus Christ, covers your sin. It's gone. As far as the east is from the west, he doesn't remember it anymore. Isn't it awesome when you come to him and you say, I did it again. He says, did what again? I don't remember that. See, I'm not God, I can't forget. He's God, he can forget. He says he forgets. And that's taken out of Proverbs. Love covers all sins. Because God is love, isn't he? Now, don't, you got to hear me. Uh, like I said, I'm not into the sloppy agape. God, God is love. God loves everyone. There's nothing you can do to earn his love. But you're not going to be right with God unless you repent. There's no salvation without repentance. I thought it would be fitting if we're going to talk about love if we read God's description of himself and what real love is. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 4 says, Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. 
It does not demand its own way. It's not irritable, and it keeps no record of being wronged. It does not rejoice with injustice, but rejoices whenever truth wins out. Love never gives up, never loses faith, is always hopeful, and endures through every circumstance. See, that's the love we're talking about. That's the love that covers you. That's the love that covers sin because it keeps no record of wrong. So when we sin, not if, when we sin, we go to the Father, we go to the the mercy seat and we lay our sin before Him. And we can rise up and go and do what He's called us to do in confidence, knowing that He's forgiven us. And over time, as you step out in faith and you get to know His love more and more and you surrender your life more and more, you sin less and less. Hopefully most of my sins now are not of commission but of omission. Hopefully as we mature, it's the things we don't do, not the things we do do. And then he ends with this, with this awesome, wonderful, powerful statement. And I think that it's tied in to what he just prayed. He says, now, all glory to God. But think about it. If he's tying it in to what he just prayed, could it be that when we experience his love, when we really understand, begin to understand his awesome, wonderful love, how much he loves us, and we begin to step out into it, could it be that then this, this statement that Paul makes really comes to life. Could it be that maybe one of the reasons we're not seeing the things, I mean, it's a pretty powerful song, promise. He's able. He's able. God is able, through his mighty power at work within us, to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. One version says, imagine. Could it be that we don't experience those wonderful, awesome things that that we can think, we can imagine, because we're not knowing his love and we're in fear and we're in condemnation we're in rebellion but if we step out and begin to to walk in faith instead of fear because we know his love then we begin to see these very things that Paul is proclaiming that he's able he's able to do more infinitely more super abundantly more than we can even ask or think Glory to him in the church. Now, remember, the book, the letter of Ephesians is written to who? The church. The, church. The, the gathering together of the saints that were meeting in Ephesus and beyond. It's not to an individual. It's to the body of believers. So the glory of God is poured out in the body of believers as we begin to work together in this place of understanding his love, and stepping out in faith. And I can't wait till after... See, we're going, we're going away this afternoon. Pray for your elders as we go away this afternoon. And especially pray for the elders' wives because, get this. See, we're not the, I'm not the only one that makes mistakes. So three or four months ago, I sent an email down to Silver Bay. You know, can we have the same arrangements as last year? Yeah, no problem. I have to move you to this building instead of that building, but it's no problem. So I emailed her on Tuesday to confirm. And she called me, like within five minutes, said... I forgot, and we're booked. I'm like, great. Where are we going to meet now? We're going to Mike and Rilda's house. <laughs> <laughs> so she says, give me a few minutes. I'll call you right back. So she called back, and, and we, they put us in this cottage. It's a four-bedroom cottage, which is awesome. It's, it's going to be private and wonderful. And, and if you rent it, it's $3,000 a week to rent this thing. So they, they made us arrangements there, but there's only one bathroom. Yeah. <laughs> so it's good thing we don't have to get up and get dressed and go anywhere. We just got to walk down to the thing to eat. The woods. <laughs> so anyhow, pray for our wives especially. Anyhow, we won't, we won't camp out there. Those who know their God will be strong and do great exploits. 
And, and you know, I, I know that I'm twisting it a little bit, but I don't think it's unbiblical to say those that know how much God loves them will be strong and do great exploits. So if I could have the worship team come on up and the prayer ministry team, um, I believe that God wants to reveal himself in a powerful way to some folks this morning, if not already. I know we had an awesome prayer time already, um, but if there's somebody here who really hasn't experienced the love of God in a way that, I mean, you can tell I'm excited about it because I've experienced it. He loves me and I know it. I don't understand it, but I know it. Anybody relate to that? I mean, I don't think I'm all that lovable. I don't deserve his love, but he loves me. And he loves me in such a powerful way that he's forgiven me, he's empowered me, he's blessed me with every spiritual blessing even. Think about it. So you want to stand up and we'll begin to uh, worship and the, uh, the front will be open for prayer. If you've never experienced his love, come on up and we'll pray for you. If you've experienced it but it's kind of grown dry or it's, it's diminished, come up, we'll pray for you. If you're, if you're walking in it but you want more, if you want, if you want to experience more of his love, Come on up and we'll pray for you. Or if there's something completely different that God has put on your heart. You want freedom from fear. You want freedom from this feeling of always being under condemnation. If you just want to live free the way that he's promised, come on up and we'll pray for you. Believing that God will do what he's promised to do. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Father, I pray that as we...